uh, somewhat of a world authority, and he's always pondered on this great landslide. I, I like, and the likes of Ramus Gulwar as well, uh, amongst other people, Keith Moore, from formerly from All Hallows School. But as this comes through, you'll see I got into this by, by complete accident, actually. So it's um, one of the most famous landslides in the world, happened on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, 1839. And it was made famous by uh, Coney Beer and Buckland, particularly, who wrote uh, a, an early paper with Mary Buckland's illustrations and William Dawson, who was a surveyor from Exeter. And they produced this, this very famous paper called the Ten Plates with that typical Victorian sort of long, long verbiage, a plan, sections and views representing the changes produced on the coast of East Devon between Axmouth and Lyme Regis by the subsidence of the land and the elevation of the bottom of the sea. And it was only the second ever scientific um, account of a landslide um, and probably the first one that actually tried to produce a model for it there. Where are we? So we're in the undercliff between Lyme Regis and Seaton and in fact uh, Bindon or Dowlands Goat Island is just there more towards Seaton than Lyme Regis um, two-thirds of the way across very inaccessible area uh, a long walk in a long walk out and here's a view from, from the air from using drone photography, which is fantastic these days. So here's the back of the cliff. And Goat Island is this huge lump of land, 16 acres of land, an estimated 8 million tons of rock that slipped seaward, creating this huge chasm behind it. And it's the chasm that has really got people's imagination because there are landslides all over the place but there are very few that have a chasm that's 600 meters long 200 meters wide and 45 meters deep and the coast guards at the time they apparently stood in the fields up here somewhere presumably like here and they watched the ground subsiding on the christmas eve and the christmas day on the moonlight in the evening it must have been an incredible sight and luckily for us, Natural England have now opened the footpath, the coast path, over the top of Goat Island due to problems with uh, other landslides uh, in the actual old path. So the coast path now actually goes down through the ravine, the western end of the chasm, and across the open grassland, and it makes it a lot more accessible. So here's one of Mary Buckland's watercolour illustrations looking east towards the West Dorset Cliffs in the background, you see Golden Cap and Stone Barrow. And you can see this enormous great big chasm is formed by the land which has subsided and back tilted, like any typical landslide really, but there's this huge bulk of Goat Island on the seaward side, which has slipped, slipped out. Um, a photograph from uh, Charles Grover, who was based in All Hallows, um, was a photographer. Very, very useful, these old photographs, because, you know, watercolours, Victorians particularly, are prone to exaggeration, whereas these old big glass plate slides, really useful record of what's going on there. And what's going on there, you can see, is complicated. Because our problem today is that the chasm is completely covered in ash trees. I mean, it may not stay that way with ash dieback, but I suspect ash dieback isn't going to help. It's going to make it even more difficult to get, get in there in the future. But so it's all covered. That's why it's a nature reserve, of course. And then looking the other direction towards the west with the beer head in the background. And again, we can see Goat Islands. We can see the, the chasm block, but it doesn't seem to have dropped as much. So again, early photograph. These are all stored in Lyme Regis Museum. Um, I don't know who took this one or what date, but it's actually very, very useful, as we will find later on. <clears throat> and then on the beach, the other really sp famous spectacular feature was this huge heave, toe heave of the foreshore. So the seabed was raised by 40 feet offshore, creating this harbour, or so-called harbour, um, with these massive great mounds. And of course, the Victorians loved this sort of spectacle of nature. Queen Victoria viewed it from the royal yacht. Um, somebody from Honiton was so overwhelmed by the sight that they were taken back to their sickbed and only recovered with some great difficulty. I mean, it must have been phenomenal. So William Dawson, the surveyor, he realised that 
we needed a map, but also a map with a sort of um, orthographic view to try and give the depth of this thing. So this is 1840, long before aerial photography or anything like that. He also produced a whole series of cross sections through the chasm and the landslide. But the only one he produced across the whole complex was this line here, pretty much north-south, but it only clips the edge of Goat Island. And everyone's assumed it's this section that Conybeer used in the paper, the 10 plates paper, as he tried to explain what happened. Basically, they thought that the soft fox mold sand squirted out like toothpaste, allowing the blocks to subside. But there's all sorts of problems with that. The, the, the strata are all over the place and there are, there are varying degrees of missing rock between the different beds. And looking at that back block, the geometry just doesn't really seem to want to fit into the uh, complex. I mean, in fairness, I mean, this was the first time anyone tried to do this. Um, cutting edge stuff at the time, no doubt. So over the last 140 odd years, various people have come up with ideas, a rotational landslide, a large curving arcuate landslide, or a deeper shear surface, a linear shear surface as a translational landslide. But really nobody, I think, has been able to come up with a satisfactory explanation for how it happened. And part of that is actually that this diagram is very misleading. It was measured in the 17th of March, 1840 by William Dawson. We can see that the top of the cliff is the hedge forming the Eastern boundary of Great Bindon. And on the Goat Island, it's the continuation of the hedge. So on the map, that's there. But you can see the section that Dawson drew is nothing like the section in this, this one here. The only section, as I say, that he did through the whole landslide was there. And so people have assumed that this is the section, but it isn't. And crucially, there are actually two different landslides at play here and mixing them together like that is, is not good. So where is Coney Beer's section? Uh, I, I, if, it, if it's there, then we've only got a fraction of Goat Island. Goat Island's nearly twice as wide in the, in the section that it is on the map. Um, I think it's a composite. I think as they worked on it, they realized the significance of the different events and muddled through. So I think that section there is the back scar. And this section here is the front of the landslide and they've made up the middle. It's a composite. And the problem with doing that, it's a bit like taking one of these and doing that to it. And then asking how many engines, how many seats, and that classic question, how many planes would it take to cover an area the size of Wales? You can't do it because you've got the wrong information and it's caught a lot of people out over the years. So very much later, 1980s, we had John Pitts did his PhD. He mapped the entire undercliff with a theodolite, a machete and a packet of John Player special, which are in his scales and his photographs. And here, in Goat Island, we can now see that there's a landslide, a big arcuate landslide called Dowlands. And next to it is Goat Island and the chasm, which is the Bindon landslide. So there are two different landslides and then older and younger landslides, smaller landslides around it. So the historic accounts are really useful. Cracks were encountered by a merry party on their way back from Dowlands on Christmas Eve and the, um, the cottages are described east of the cape-like projection of the upper range, which would become the scene of the next and greatest convulsion, which did not show itself until the following midnight, so Christmas Day. So here's the old tithe map, and we can see Dowlands is there. Sorry, we can see Dowlands, the arcuit feature, and we can see this cape-like headland, which was to become Goat Island. So when we look back at Dawson's map, now, here are the cottages, Downland's cottages. Here is the pre-existing landslide. It failed first on Christmas Eve, 1839. It took away the support for Bindon, which followed a day later on Christmas Day. But the main movement was to the southeast, pushing up the seafloor, seabed, 
in front of Dowlands, not in front of Bindon. And a lot, this is what's caught a lot of people out. They thought the heave was actually sort of over here, but it's not, it's here. So as I say, the chasm, interesting. Look at this, this block here. You can see it's come from the back of the cliff. The, the back of Goat Island has slid back into the chasm. You imagine the ground opening up. You've actually got two cliffs, both wanting to fail in opposite directions. It's actually really obvious. This is the northeastern corner of Goat Island, where there's this enormous great block of rock, which you can see used to be there. And it slipped northwards back into the chasm. Again, nobody's actually got this sort of detail so far. When you look at back at the old photograph, you can actually see it. There's that block I've just shown you. Here are these fissures running through, but that's a scar face. All of this massive block has slipped back towards the chasm. And as you go further, you basically need bare grills with you. It becomes impenetrable. You can't really get any further due to the broken ground and the vegetation. And in places like Dowlands, there are these enormous great ridges, high prominent ridges, arc form ridges. This one's called Cat Ridge. And there's Ramus, Ramus Gulwar in the distance there for scale. Interesting features. So landslides, they happen because we have Cretaceous rocks, the chalk and the green sand, which are permeable, sitting on top of impermeable clay. And the rainwater soaks down through those permeable rocks, reaches the clay, it can't sink any further. So it flows along the bedding plane, weakening the rock surface, lubricating it, allowing great big lumps to slide away. And, and most of our landslides happen, um, are, are translational, they happen on a shear surface, which is most typically the unconformity, which if you don't know what that is, I'll explain in a minute. Beautiful, simple, lovely diagram, isn't it? Until you put the blocks back. And now you see that the blocks don't fit. They don't fit at all. And in fact, there are lots and lots of sections and models, even a quite high resolution scientific papers that are like this, where if you cut the blocks out, put them back, they don't fit because people have just drawn what they think is there based on what they can see on the surface. What's missing, you'll notice, are wedges, big wedges of rock. And I'll come back to that if we have time. But the landslides are not confined to the unconformity, to the junction between the clay and the sand, which is up here. This is Lyme Regis looking back towards Black Venn um, in February and May 2006. 300 meters of the cliff collapsed in about 20 minutes because here there's a weak surface in the top of the blue lias, the Jurassic rocks here, in fact. And when you look at Lyme Regis, there are weak shear surfaces running through the fields and into the town. And this is why 60 million pounds of money has been spent holding back the town, but also based on understanding how the landslides work, which is a really, really significant piece of work. And on the <coughs> west side of Lyme Regis, on Monmouth Beach, again, we can see that same weak surface as on the east side, and above it, another one. So there are multiple weak surfaces which can form landslides. So we have to do the geology. This is Pinhay Bay, my, my favorite part of the coast, quiet, out of the way, hardly ever see anybody, ideal for a grumpy geologist like me. Um, we have the chalk and the green sand on the back of the cliff. We have the Jurassic rocks forming the main sea cliff, and then the Triassic white lias at the base of the cliff there. And below that, the red Mercia mudstone that you would see at Seton which is now under the sea. And <clears throat> all of these rocks, they were laid down in the Triassic, the Jurassic, so 190, 200 million years ago. Uh, thousands of meters were laid down. And then about 100 million years ago, earth movements compressed the rocks and tilted them to the east. And like a seesaw, they became planed away by erosion as those rocks rose up before the sea returned in the Cretaceous to lay down the green sand, which is fox mold at the bottom part, chert at the top, and the chalk. And it's this sandwich of rocks that forms the coast, and the junction is an angular unconformity. So at Pinhay Bay, 
you can see Cretaceous, Jurassic and Triassic rocks, so just west of Lyme Regis. Whereas at Haven Cliff, just east of Axmouth, we've got Triassic sitting um, below Cretaceous, all the Jurassic has already been eroded away. And Bindon and Dowland sits in this absolutely unique position on the Jurassic coast, where we have both the, un the unconformity, which is a, a, a landslide surface, but also we have potentially at least two others in the Jurassic, which are known to be weak and can cause landslides. If you're struggling with that, here's, here's a view of it from a geographical point of view. There's Pinhay Bay, west of Lyme, and here is Haven Cliff, east of Seaton, and that's the reason. So the, the rocks are folded, accord, the Jurassic rocks are, are, are eroded out, but it's a unique position sitting just there. So the, the, one of the primary questions is where is the weak surface? Where is the where, where's the failure? Is it on the unconformity or is it in the Jurassic rocks? Or as Dennis and John Pitts suggested, even somewhere in below the blue, the white lias, uh, the base of the, um, of the, the, the very end of the Triassic. And there are papers which, which um, put forward each of those as options. And the reason I got into this was because there's another landslide to the uh, east of Dowlands called the Plateau, where this foreshore is quite extraordinary. From the first time I visited it, here are the Jurassic rocks and they're mashed up. They're mashed and folded in with the Cretaceous strata. They're all part of the same landslide. Here's the very base of the blue lias, the bottom of the Jurassic rocks, folded and mashed with shear surfaces running through them here. And below that, this is the white lias here and the blue lias there. Now, some people have said this is structural as in ancient tectonic, but there is no mineralization. This is a melange of gr recently ground up rock. This landslide, the plateau landslide, is on one of those failure surfaces in the Jurassic. And that's quite significant. So when I was the Earth Science Manager, we got some, uh, some money from Natural England and flew our own little um, <coughs> drone flight along this part of the shore in order to map it. And Natural England liked it so much, they extended it towards Dowlands as well, where we knew there was some other interesting stuff. And this is Dowlands here. There, there are enormous shears running through the cliff and across the foreshore. And the fox mold sits normally below the church. There's, there's about 10 meters displacement between these rocks. And actually, when you start to really physically think about how does that displacement happen, it starts to get really difficult. But anyway, it kept me out of the office for weeks, months even, uh, because I was able to map things down to the sort of size of a, of a tennis ball on this, on this foreshore. And it came up with a series of lines. There, there is the, those are the two previous shots and a series of lines. So what we're trying to do is, is understand the structure. But one of the things that came out of this was that you can see the toe heave that Dawson mapped in this outcrop. There it is running. See these bulbous shapes here? That's this here. And this big long feature here, Corbin rocks is there like that. This big mound is this big mass here. So we've actually got the toe heave. And then Dennis said to me, have you looked at the LIDAR? And LIDAR is laser ranging. So using a laser from an aerial, uh, uh, from an aeroplane. And I thought with the trees, it would be no good, but wow, look at that. That's amazing. It's like taking the trees away. Poor old John Pitts, all those months sweating through the forests there with his machete. You can just sit at home making a map. And if you get bored with that, you can take the sea away and look at the um, seabed, the bathymetry as well. And let's take a step back. Look at that. I think that's one of the most fabulous images you can ever see. There's, here's Goat Island and here's Dowlands. There's the plateau landslide. But you can see for the first time that the landslide actually extends potentially 400 meters offshore at least. And the in situ rocks are folded. This is, this is a syncline, like a saucer shaped bowl. This is an anticline, a, a bowl up on the front, going back into another fold here. So the rocks are folded, which is obvious, they are folded. 
And there are faults, which Ramus has spent a lot of work, a lot of time on. So the next picture is going to be uh, pushing this photo photography as much as we can, and then stepping out a little bit further. So the very head of Dowlands, and what we can see here is that the landslides are breaking along the joints in the rock. So rocks, when they're lifted and heaved and strained, they crack, typically in conjugate structures, faults or shears that are 90 degrees to each other or, or roughly. And the landslide is exploiting those. And similarly, you can actually see through the trees, you can see the shape and the form of Dowlands, and it reflects that same jointing in the cliff, arguably. <clears throat> um, the next thing was a guy called John King said, you need to process the data further to, to get a better idea of slope. And so very kindly, John Grimes partnership down in um, near, near Plymouth did the work for us, took the data. Uh, it loses resolution, but it emphasizes slope. And again, what a useful map this is. Have a look at this top northeast corner of Goat Island. Look at it in the LIDAR. It's really hard to see what's going on, isn't it? Normally I hear a hmm, but I'm assuming you're going hmm. And look at that. It's resolved it, it's completely, uh, it's nailed it, as the youth would say, nailed it. Because I walked around here, but I was thinking, how on earth am I gonna map this? And it's done it. So, um, obviously looking at all these shapes and structures, it's tempting to try and imagine what's going on. These are arcuate shear surfaces. These are defining large blocks that are sliding off Goat Island. And you can see that they're actually eating their way into Goat Island as well. This is Dowlands. And there's another one potentially there, although we could argue about that. And then there are more arcuate features at the back going through the chasm. And then really perplexingly, there are more shears that seem to be in the opposite of these. They're in the, they're the reverse, they're going the other way, which is really hard to explain. And then linear features running through Goat Island itself. And then something else out there, the northwest corner, an entirely different landslide, I think, and then potentially another one. So if your head's hurting, it's really simple. Curved shapes are where an arcuate, a curved shear, interacts with a, a surface. So in this case, the curve of the wine glass interacting with the flat surface of the wine. It gives a curve, an arc. Whereas straight lines are straight lines. They could be at an angle like that, but they're basically straight. So it's actually really quite simple. The real thing, in order to understand this and come up with a modern model to, to, to replace, not replace, but to enhance Coneybeer's section, is to understand what those structures look like in cross section. And basically, these curving features form the south facing uh, ridges or, or uh, arcs, uh, uh, landslide faces. And there's another one going into there. These yellow ones are the reverse structures which seem to be forming the other side of these great big landslide blocks, perhaps. I should say, I think with all of these, because I don't actually know, I'm not saying I know, I'm saying this is the best I can do. These long linear features well, the one at the back is this sloping face. So why not put some more big linear sloping blocks in there like that? Then we know in the back of the chasm, there are these curving features again and more like that. So it's something like that. The LIDAR, it, it offers you know, it, it more detail. Look at that, you can actually see detail in there. You can see these arcuate shears, but I think arguably, you can also see the joint faces, the straight shears, the straight blocks. And what I've come up with to explain this landslide is a very simple model. So the landslides, they propagate, they eat up through the beds, through the Cretaceous rocks, uh, interacting with the jointing. So as they come through, they break away joints, blocks that are defined by the joints, the natural jointing. When the next landslide happens, what it's going to do is take all of that and slide them back. So now we have, this is a translational block here, um, 
with rotated blocks around it. So one of the, the landslide classification is very, it's complicated, I think, because there are translational landslides which slide along a translational shear surface. And then there are rotational landslides which rotate. But here I'm saying is this is the translational element and then there are rotated blocks in between. And um, these big blocks here form the prominent ridges like Cat Ridge. And I hope I can persuade you that this might be right because look, surely that is that, that block is that, and that block is that. It certainly works, doesn't it? Again, I hope I can hear it. Mm. It gets really complicated because there are lots of interactions. There are shears interacting with each other. And when I got to here, I gave up trying to draw this because it got too difficult. And then there's those. We'll worry about those later on. But Dennis and, and John in so also kept saying, you know, you've got to stop doing this, Rich. You've got to make a map. You've got to do a map before anything else. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're just playing around. And I didn't because, quite frankly, I was overwhelmed by the prospect of trying to map this. It's really, really difficult. And I didn't really have the tech to do it. But eventually, last year, I did. And the first thing I noticed was it looks like the hedge lines have rotated slightly. You see that hedge line there? So Goat Island has actually swiveled round. And then what I decided to do was to put it all back. So I, I've drawn all those blocks, made them into objects, and put them back. So this is very like the tithe map with the cape-like headland and the Dowlands landslide. And I've tried to sequence the event. So we know that on Christmas Eve, uh, or before several weeks before Christmas Eve, cracks were appearing in the cliff face. And then there's Dowland's cottage. So Christmas Eve, Dowland started to fail. As it failed, it took away the support for Goat Island, but in this area here. So that allowed Goat Island to start to swivel slightly, to rotate. There's, there's a hinge, hinge um, slip. And there's this lovely account of a sound like renting cloth. You imagine these big fissures opening up, tearing, renting. That makes sense, doesn't it? It really does make sense. And as the landslide progressed, uh, things developed. So you'll notice that the chasm is very much more developed here than it is there because this is twisting outwards. And the very last thing to happen is this main chasm block to break away like that to, uh, to eventually form what we see today. Again, I'm not saying that's definitely it, but that's the best I can do. So we have a detailed map of the complex, an idea of how far and in which direction things have moved. We can produce, well, clever people can produce cross sections anywhere using the LIDAR data. And so it's time for some modeling, which um, is not easy. Don't try this at home. I started this three years ago, three and a half years ago, and it's been the hardest thing I've ever done by a long way. I'm, I'm in a geologist, not a geomorphologist, but mapping, I like mapping, but this was hard, really hard. I've got lots of lines, but I'm only gonna show you line two, very briefly line three. Line three is actually the one. But the problem is, not to, in order not to fall into that trap, we need to know what the underlying structure of the rocks might be. We need to know what the landscape may have been like before they failed and what form the shears take. And the first thing I didn't notice, the thing I spent a long time looking for was a structure. And it's actually really obvious. The, the, the rocks, including the Cretaceous rocks, are folded in a really, in what's called a monocline, rather like down at um, Whitecliffe at Beer it's, what, itself. The rocks are folded. Every other model has assumed that it's just a simple linear structure, but they're folded or faulted. There's also this massive great dry valley that runs from Roosden straight that sorry that's that view there that's the previous picture looking back this way so there's an enormous dry valley that runs through here the front of goat island the slope is part of that valley so at one time before the landslide happened there was a big valley it could have been as deep as steps lane or any of the other dry valleys around this part and i think there's evidence for that in the landslide but i haven't got time to talk about that today but here is essentially sort of some contours suggesting what that would have been like. And it explains a lot of people say, you know, the land's moved a long way, 
But actually, if, if half the land wasn't there in the first place, then it hasn't moved that far. And then the shears. So here are those curving shears, the Binden shears. Here are those, sorry, the Dowlands. Here are the Binden shears. Goat Islands moved that way. The chasm blocks have moved that way. These blocks have moved that way. So that's that. So there are deep, steep shears running at the back and all of the back of Goat Island is sliding in. So three different shear groups and the original jointing. So this is line two. This is the line I'm going to show you to finish off with. Um, here's again, uh, Charles Grover's image. We're going down the back of the scar over the huge back tilted field, the back, the main chasm block into a rift up onto Goat Island and across Goat Island. Um, and this is what I was trying earlier on. Let's hope this works without any problems. Are we, are we there, Mike? Is that good? You got that? Yeah, we have. So yeah, through the chasm, over Goat Island, through the landslide in front of Goat Island, just clipping these peculiar reverse structures here, which I'm not gonna have time to talk about. And what I've basically done is put the geology back. Well, no, we can, we can see where the, where the geology is. We can see where the unconformity is at the front of Goat Island and the back of the scar. Can't really tell where it is here because it might be cut away by the shear. But what I've done is then is to put, reconstruct the landscape. There's enough of this landscape here to put it back got an idea from the mapping how far it's moved and now we've got one two three places where we could draw a line and speculate where the unconformity is and also with the the chasm block the back of the chasm block has got to be close to the form of the chasm cliff let's put that back there and we can start to suggest what what form the actual back scar might take and then it's the same with the rest. And after that, it's just like a, a monkey with a typewriter finding the shapes and forms that allow me to move these pieces to where they are now. And that is not easy. <laughs> I'm gonna click, I'm gonna skip all this because time is running running past. So basically, I've reconstructed the whole landscape. Here's the Roosden Dry Valley. We're talking, you know. Uh, 125,000 years ago, possibly longer. There was a landslide developed in the front of Goat Island before 1839. But then we know that on Christmas Eve, the landslide moved and absolutely nothing's happened here because Dowlands is away over there in the distance. It, this is not affected. It was only on Christmas day evening that that failure, that unloading allowed Goat Island to start to break away and slide down the cliff. And as it started to move, these back blocks are sliding into the rifts that are opening up as the blocks move. The whole thing is sliding seaward. Finally, the main chasm block breaks later on and off it goes. And the point of rotation, I'm not going to explain that because we really haven't got time today. Mike, how much time have I got? Okay, we are at nearly at 10 past. So uh, we've got 20 minutes before the end of the presentation, but if you can take no more than 10 minutes, then uh, we've got that's, some time for questions. That's fine, that's going to work. So there it is, that's uh, the end of the event. Basically what is happening down here with Binden is these blocks are being shunted into this syncline and they're shearing into new forms new blocks i think there's the toe heave there and then so that's that's the line we're looking at on dawson's old map um and then we've got erosion which takes us to today and now when you stand on the beach and look back up there's goat island in the distance there there's the line of section two and here's the old riverbed from the dry the, the dry valley so i'm not saying that's it. It's just, I'm just saying that's the best I could do. Um, and what that means when you when you walk up onto Goat Island, as you come up the, the steep climb at the steps at the back, you're actually climbing up this big block where the back has slipped into the rift behind it. There. And 
um, you're standing on this, what I'm calling a rotated block. And then there's a complex zone and then a translational block beyond it. So there we are coming up the steps. Everything here has slipped back and collapsed into a rift behind us there. As I've seen, I've got that already. Standing on the top of Goat Island, this, um, this is the complex zone. Everything, all of these blocks here have all slipped slightly this way into the rift as the, as the chasm opened up, I think. And then sitting on the front, that lovely view on the front, this is the translational block. This is the block that has just simply slipped down the shear, foot, shear plane without any stress or strain. So it's remained completely intact. And if you had been standing there 120,000 years ago, maybe a bit longer, you'd have actually been looking down into a deep, dry valley, just like looking down over um, Whitlands today, perhaps. And the reason the landslide was so massive was because this whole cape-like headland sat on this, on this southerly dipping slope, this, this limb of the, of the syncline. And so eventually, when it was unloaded, it allowed a big movement to take place. And it stopped because the dips are getting shallower up here. You can also see I've modeled this entirely on the unconformity, but I'm not saying that it is actually all on the unconformity. I, I haven't got time to explain. What might happen next? I think we might see a little bit of movement in the top of the cliff, but quite frankly, I think this movement was so massive, it's hundreds of years before we're going to see anything which is a good guarantee that tomorrow morning we'll wake up to news that the whole landslides failed. What I would expect to see are these landslides, these shears eating their way into Goat Island. That would be the next movement, I think. And you know, arguably all the way through. I think we might see something over there, something over there, but thousands of years. It was such a big movement. I don't think we'll see anything. Now that's line three much more complicated and I haven't got time to explain it today but um, that was really difficult. This is this is Dowlands here and then this is Goat Island or what becomes Goat Island there but it's a similar sort of process at the back here but uh, everything is being shunted into this syncline. That is difficult. I'm, I'm not going to talk any more about it. And really the only way to, to really nail this thing is to map it and model it in 3D. And I'm not going to do that. This, there were times when I was thinking so hard, I had to lie down because it was so difficult. And the last thing I want to do is try and fight some software and try and figure out how software works. This is something for a bright young thing. And I tried to get uh, academics interested and I got nowhere. I've since, I've, I've actually put this forward as a paper for the Proceedings of the Geologist Association and they have accepted it with major amendments. One of them being that the modeling is too Mickey Mouse, which is what I said anyway. But this is all I can do. I can't do any better. The other comment was that uh, it, the language is too informal, but I'm not going to codify text to, to you know, please a few people. I'm probably, I've talked to Donald Campbell about publishing this as a, uh, as a public leaflet, as part of a work he wants to do on the, uh, on the landslides this next winter. Um, and you know, quite frankly, the peer reviewers, they may pinch the ideas, they may decide to get a student involved. I don't know, and I don't think I really care that much. <laughs> um, and so that brings me to the end, really. And as I say, I, I'm not saying it's, this is it, I'm saying it might be something like this. Thank you very much. Well, I did laugh at uh, your jokes as well, uh, Richard. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, let's have a quick look at some uh, questions before we go on any further. So, Shall um, I stop sharing? Uh, yes, you can do. Yep. Yeah, there we go. Okay, right. So uh, one of the questions I had was, um, does the bathymetry data also come from LIDAR? No, it comes from a bathymetric survey, so using sonar rather than light laser. But otherwise, it's ex exactly the same principle. Okay. And I should have explained a bit more. The Plymouth Coastal Observatory, it's all part of this National Strategic Monitoring Programme. All the data is open source at channelcoast.org. Um, there are phenomenal data sets for around the whole coast of England where 
people you can just you, you can download it and use it it's, it's fantastic and they have helped me as well next question uh, do you need to invoke plastic deformation of the less competent layers thickening and thinning to explain the missing rock wedges no and the reason i say that is the plateau landslide which is just immediately to the east you can well i can see the entire geological sequence uh, undeformed in landslide blocks including the soft fox mold sand that's that's what's so interesting about the plateau foreshore there's no plastic deformation other than at the extreme edges but the blocks themselves are complete competent blocks okay, thank you um, another question, uh, why did it happen so fast and why were there not more warning signs? Well, apparently, the, say the cracks were opening up several weeks before Christmas and that, that year, 1839, was a very wet year. The rain figures, I think, had doubled the, uh, the average. So you, heavy rain, you'd expect landslides. Um, well, they didn't know in those days. They, they didn't really know about these things. Um, but you know i've also we've had some really wet years since 2012 and we haven't really had any big landslides um, the one thing i've learned is never try and predict where a landslide is going to happen okay another question um did you uh, or have you used any results from other methods such as seismic or electromagnetic resonance imaging to try to locate some of the fault planes Yes, Plymouth, Plymouth University used a thing called resistivity, electrical resistivity, um, which can penetrate apparently down to about 60 meters. And um, we had a, 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 a lecturer there, and Andy, oh, I've forgotten his second name, and, and his student, who again, I've forgotten the name. And they did two surveys. The one across the plateau, across the Goat Island itself, really didn't get down to the depth we needed. The one in the, uh, along the, um, the chasm block was interesting, but it's it's really hard to interpret. <clears throat> I would like to see shallow seismic. I think you can you can get seismic which will go down because the trouble is you've got to carry everything in, and natural England won't uh, be very happy with setting up explosives or doing drilling rigs. But shallow seismic, I think, could give us some really good answers. And offshore, I mean, where I think I think the landslide, the shear surface to the southeast is in the Lias. And, but as you come up into the landslide, it, it, it propagates into the unconformity almost seamlessly. So offshore, a bit of shallow seismic offshore might well provide the answer, but I don't have a boat. No, no indeed. Um, I think you might've answered this already, but uh, can the model be used for forecasting? And I suspect that uh, the simplicity of your model is, uh, means probably not really intended for that. Well, um, again, there, there, there's been a lot of effort to try and look at coastal erosion risk mapping around the country. Um, but people only use a very generic sort of, they look at the recession rates from, uh, from the last 50 or 100 years and then apply them back. And what this shows is that actually everything depends on the dip of the rocks. If you don't know what the dips of the rock are, going back into the cliff, you can't actually predict what the erosion rates are going to be because they will change. So actually, and, and the British Geological Survey have 3D geological mapping now. That's what needs to be applied when you want to look at risk is what are the dips doing? Because they will tell you or give you a better idea of where the risks actually are and how those risks might be changing. Hmm. Uh, and one last one. Um, is a measure of success of your modeling uh, the ability to keep the material balance, i.e., to not lose any volume of material anywhere? And oh well, thank you very that. much. Yeah, that's it's called a kinematically correct model, and so it, it is basically by starting, you know, by by putting it all back and then start making the blocks and not losing any of the blocks, moving them around. That's what I've done, and it is very very, very difficult. I mean, beyond, <laughs> I didn't really have no, I don't even know why it's so difficult, but it, it really is. But yes, it's, it's, it's a balanced model or a kinematically correct thing. So you, I'm, I'm, I'm firmly, a, I'm, maybe that's why the um, peer reviewers didn't like my paper because I'm saying you can't actually draw landslides 
unless you do it this way by putting it back and reconstructing it. Maybe I upset some people. I hope so. Okay, well, now I've got another observation here. So uh, you rather dismissed landslide forecasting, but in many parts of the world, landslides are major hazards to urban populations and real time monitoring is being used to provide warnings. In addition, accumulated rainfall thresholds can be used as useful thresholds for longer term probabilistic indications. Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I live in Lyme Regis, so um, you know, where there's a risk with population and people and property and infrastructure, then absolutely. And, and what the engineers have done in Lyme with um, the geologists and geomorphologists is, is world breaking, ground beating. Because originally when they started at Lyme 25 years ago, the engineers thought the problem was that the sea hit the seawalls, the seawalls fell over and that caused damage. And they went away and actually did a lot of work with um, a lot of people and realize that actually the town is built on these old landslides. So Lyme is an absolutely fantastic exemplar of how you do the modeling, the mapping to actually come up with the right engineering intervention. Um, in the open wider coast, that's what I was talking about. You know, I've, I've tried, I've got, oh, that's got to go, that's got to go. And it's the bit behind you that goes, it's, it's, you know, it's very, but then that's because in the open coast, we don't have that level of detailed monitoring. If you have the monitoring, you can actually start to see where the movement is, what's happening. Okay, so, um, oh, I've, we've got another another one here. Um, you could try Tromino passive seismic surveying, small and portable. BGS helped us do this survey on a project, was useful to identify the main boundaries. Tromino passive seismic surveying. I'm writing it down. Maybe, uh, uh, Carol, if you could uh, um, elucidate a little bit further, that sounds quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there are there are a few places where the, where there's the blocks are big enough, like that big translational block at the front of Goat Island. I think the geology is solid. There's a chance the geology is solid enough to actually get a really good seismic line down to the uh, to the shear surface, and it would actually tell us or give us at least a, a better idea of of what's going on. Even if it just showed where the unconformity was, and we can see how wrong or how right I am, that'd be really interesting. <laughs> Well, yeah, indeed. There's Braid. There's the, the another one. Does the origin of the landslide complex date back into the Pleistocene? Yes. <laughs> that's uh, that's part of the difficulty. Um, some of that, you can see how it goes 300, 400 metres offshore. Some of that landslide activity could be um, from the, the last interglacial or the interglacial before that, so 250,000 years or more um, old. And it's you know, when you get, I mean, I, again, I tried, I actually tried to, um, to model that far back, but then you've got changing sea levels, higher sea levels, lower sea levels, it becomes really difficult. And I just wound it back to, you know, 1839 is, is good enough. But even building those um, early landslide blocks at the front of my models, I had to start by putting them all back in place. And you have to progressively fail them one after the other to try and get them to arrive in the right place. It's, I said it before, it's really difficult. I'm not going to do it again. I never want to do it ever again. Okay, so we're getting uh, relatively close to the end. What I'd like to do is, um, uh, to, to thank uh, Richard on behalf of everybody for the presentation. If you want to unhide your video and give us a show of clapping, uh, that would be really nice. Uh, so let's get everybody unhiding their video. And then, yeah, let's do that. Okay, and let's give oh, hello, a everybody. round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. We had so many good comments um, about uh, that presentation uh, come uh, through the feed. So that was good. And what I'd just like to do is to finish off um, with sharing a, a slide. So once again, um, to end the, the presentation, uh, please uh, give us feedback. In the, in the feed, there should be a link 
um, to a survey monkey um, survey, and that will give us some valuable information on who uh, has taken part, where they've taken from, what could be improved, etc. Uh, once again, thanks to our sponsors. Uh, that's an important thing to uh, to share um, with everybody. And <clears throat> to say we've got another presentation tomorrow, uh, beavers on the River Otter, uh, presentation from the uh, Devon Wildlife Trust. So, um, so that's what we've got lined up for tomorrow evening at 7.30. So once again, Richard, thank you and good luck. Pleasure. Everybody. Thank you all. Nice to see you all. Bye. Oh, hey. Thank you very much, Richard. It was great. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. If any, oh, um, <laughs> we've got an, um, it looks like we've got an offer for you, Richard, to go on the Stuart Cruises twice yearly. <laughs> I know, I know, uh, I know uh, the Stuarts, uh, yeah. Um, it's hard to do boat, boat trips, though, because you always find yourself, you see that tree up there, just below it to the left, there's a really interesting rock, and everyone just looks blank. <laughs> but yes, I, I, they, they, they know me, so um, they always drop a line. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if, uh, the, if there are any burning questions from anybody, uh, then now is your chance to catch Richard before he goes. I think that's, uh, yeah. No, I think no, we had some good questions as well, Richard. Uh, they were very really good. Actually, very, good. Uh, very impressed with your graphics. Um, you're obviously a whiz at PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, then. Cheers, everybody. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi. Thanks very much, Mike. Right. And uh, um, Rita. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Rita. Bye. Ah. Well done, Mike. Yeah, well, well we had uh, 74, uh, and that's that was a good uh, good turnout for tonight. Yeah, and if you if you add in sort of the, the numbers of twos we had, that's probably up to close to 90, plus. maybe even, as you say, 100. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, no, that was good. I, I, um, I'm very pleased. And, uh, and the technology all worked well, which is excellent. Yeah, did we forget anything? No, no, Put no. Link in. Oh, yeah, we got the link. For the You're link. still <laughs> recording, Mike. <laughs> Sorry? You're still recording, Mike. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I am recording. <laughs> <laughs>